Dan Auerbach for KCRW's Morning Becomes Eclectic, everybody. <laughs> and live from Apogee Studios. How are you, man? I am just starting to break a sweat. Hey, so um, tell us a little bit about um, Pat McLaughlin here, who just uh, exited stage. He, uh, he, well, I started writing with Pat last year, last summer, and um, my, my friend Ferg introduced me to Pat, and Pat um, plays, uh, you know, he, he tours with John Prine regularly, and he's sort of part of that, that circle there. But uh, we've written a ton of songs in the last year and a half. Nice. Yeah, there's a nice uh, dynamic there, you can tell. Um, and, and Julie Muncy, who's here from Warner Brothers, sent me some uh, information on him. And David Wilde from Rolling Stone says, Pat McLaughlin is a tasty, rootsy gem. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> so uh, as tasty. I said, he's ta ta tasty, that guy. I don't want to think about tasting. <laughs> So I, I said in my introduction, and I don't uh, want you to feel uncomfortable, but I, you know, I, I said that you are, um, without a doubt, one of the most important uh, musicians, producers of our time. And um, as a solo artist, as uh, you know, one half of the Black Keys, um, as the Arcs, as a producer of Ray LaMontagne, uh, Lana Del Rey, Dr. John, the Pretenders uh, and and others that I can't even think of at the moment. Um, you, sir, uh, have our admiration and respect for your thank you uh, musicianship. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> so this uh, this album, your second solo album, mm -hmm. um, it is really a, a tribute to your time in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, the Black Keys will always be associated with Akron. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but uh, you have made Nashville your home for some time Almost now. eight years now. Yeah, I moved there almost eight years ago. and um, But I, I never really settled in because we were on tour and we were working so much. And it wasn't really until last summer that I made a conscious decision, decision to not tour, to, to clear my schedule and to try to work on music at home because I'd, I'd actually never really done that. I'd never in a decade of working and touring and playing I had a clear schedule. I didn't know what that felt like. So I did that for the first time. And as soon as I did that, I started in with these writing sessions. Something else that I'd never done. Something that's like, you know, so quintessentially Nashville. And I'd been there eight years and never even tried it, you know. So I reached out to my friend Ferg, uh, David Ferguson. And uh, he just started slowly introducing me to these people. And it really, you know, it changed my world. You know, I've had the pleasure of visiting uh, Nashville one time. And, you know, anytime you go to a new city, you know, it's nice to take a good walk or a jog or, or find good coffee or something like that. And uh, I, I walked along uh, Music Row. Mm -hmm. uh, has anyone here been to Nashville? Have been to Nashville? So Half these people live in Nashville. <laughs> <laughs> but Music, music Row... Half the time is really interesting um, and speaks to the history uh, of Absolutely. the music world in Nashville. Yeah. But maybe describe well, what, music this, what this is. Well, Music Row were these houses, and they were all different uh, record labels and publishing companies and uh, songwriting teams. And, you know, people who had big dreams of becoming a big country music star would come to town. And Music Row is just a street of all these houses, and they'd go door to door and play their songs and sing. And, and it's everything related to music. You could, yeah. your, your tattoos, uh, publishing, CD but, duplication. But there's, there was all of that, but also RCA, you know, there were incredible studios. RCA Studio B was there, so, you know, they cut crazy there. They, they cut all these incredible country hits. All the, you know, that, that, the, that crew of musicians who were there in Nashville, they were working right on Music Row. You know, you can just imagine uh, someone coming straight out of the countryside to Nashville with a dream. All on the same street. It's, with all, the it's all there. With the guys who had a million top ten hits. Also. You just go door all to door. All on the same strip. Yeah, and it's, you're, you're sorted. Um, you've yeah. got everything there on Music Row. Um, you have, in your time at Nashville, you, you said that you've been touring a lot, but you also built a studio there. That's the first thing I did when I moved to Nashville is I built a studio. Yeah, downtown. I bought a little building and I sort of built a studio and based it at, uh, on studios that I really loved that made records that I loved. You know, places like Motown or Stax or Sam Phillips Recording, places and, and, where live musicians 
And had you studied together. these spaces, you know, before going into yeah, creating absolutely. your own yeah, space? Yeah, you this know, is I, this I, is called Easy Eye Sound. Yeah, my studio is called Easy Eye Sound, and and uh, yeah, it's it's sort of um, yeah, it was sort of based on those loosely, but I, I put it together, handpicked everything, and. And now it's just there, and it's sort of almost like its own little living, breathing organism. What was the building, you know, prior to? It was a call center. <laughs> That's what it was. But Willie Nelson had his first job there. Really? No, not sure. <laughs> <laughs> he, yeah, he was a. Uh, he, was, he called. Yeah, and he made phone calls. You know, he just uh, stopped in to make calls. You kidder. Uh, you know, the label uh, that this album is out is also on, it's on yeah, so Easy I, Eye. So, so is that to say that you will be setting up an actual uh, record label, putting out other artists I, That's label? what I'm doing. That's the plan right now. I'm taking it slow. I mean, you know, I'm, I, I love making records. It's what I've been doing. And the more I do it, the more I just felt like uh, it, it would be nice to put them all under one umbrella so that you know, if people are interested in something that I did, maybe they'll like another project that I did. And I think it maybe puts more eyes on, on, on uh, some of these people that I record. Tell us more about the crew that you uh, have on this record. Oh, on this record? Well, yeah, get, tell us, tell us like the top players, and just give us one line about each. Sure. Each okay, guy. Okay. So, the f the the guy who played all the keyboards, his name is Bobby Wood, and we wrote one of the songs together. Bobby Wood um, grew up in Mississippi. In playing gospel music, but when he was a teenager, he got a job working for Sam Phillips, and he was recording on Jerry Lee sessions and all kinds of Sun Records sessions. He played on uh, Hey There, Little Red Riding Hood by Sam the Sham and the Pharaohs, and then he went over to American Studios and started cutting hit after hit, like um, uh, Suspicious Minds in the Ghetto by Elvis Presley and uh, Sweet Caroline by Neil Diamond and uh, you know Son of a Preacher Man. Dusty Springfield, um, and the list just goes on and on and on. And so he plays keyboard. <laughs> okay, that's, and then, that's an all-star. Sorry, that was a really very long sentence. Okay, <laughs> and then the guy who plays uh, some of the drums, his name is uh, Bubba, and his full name's Gene Chrisman, and uh, he was Bobby's friend. They they played together in Memphis, so he's played on a million records. Uh, Dave Rowe, he played upright bass, and uh, it's funny. The first time I ever went to Nashville, when I was 18 years old, I went with my dad and we went to Lower Broadway. And the first honky-tonk I went into was a place called Roberts, Western Wear. And Dave Rowe was playing upright bass. And so, you know, this last year he's played on a bunch of records. I've had him on, you know, playing all kinds of stuff for me. And uh, he's on the record. And I mean, the, just the list goes on. The guy who played on Shine On Me, who played drums, he's 80 years old. And his name is Kenny Malone, and he played at J, he was in the Navy band uh, in the f in the 50, I don't know, when, but he played JFK's inauguration and his funeral. <laughs> and he played on Dobie Gray's Drift Away, which is kind of dope. Nice. And so these are relationships that you built over time. Yeah, and I mean, these are guys that just live in town and they, they've spent their entire lives making records, being creative and, uh, and I mean, you know, if you like think about all those songs that I just mentioned, Sweet Caroline, Suspicious Minds, they don't really have a style necessarily. They draw from the like all the beautiful styles of American music, but and I just felt such a connection because I feel like that's those are the records that I try to make too that draw from everything but aren't any one thing in particular, you know? So just being around those guys and getting to absorb that is a thrill, really. Do you have a name for this uh this gang? No, not really. No, we don't have a name. Oh, wait, they're the Easy Eye Sound. That's what they are. There it is. There it is. I forgot. We did have a name. You also feature Mark Knopfler on this record. Yeah, that was the wild card. That was the weird one because uh, he was the only one that did, it, did the, his part remotely. Ah. Um, he, we cut that song, Shine On Me, and I was listening to playback. Uh, at the console, listening to the speakers, and I just could swear. I swore I could hear his guitar. So that night, we made a rough mix of the song. I sent it to my manager, and I said, because I didn't know Mark Knopfler, I never met him, so I said, find his email, send him this song, and I just ask nicely. 
And, uh, and, and two days later, he sent it back with the guitar in it. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I still haven't met him. <laughs> Has he heard the final version? <laughs> I wonder. I hope so. So the lyrics of the, uh, the title track, the opening track on the album, Waiting on a Song, you sing, songs don't grow on trees, you got to pick them out of the breeze, fall down on your knees and pray one comes along. That's being a little dramatic. <laughs> it's true. It's very true. Well, I'm curious how songs begin in the setting that you're describing. They just, they, there's no set way, there's no blueprint. And, you know, I mean, it's all about, you know, the, the whole songwriting session thing that I did, I got really lucky because I, I had natural chemistry with these few people that I was getting together with. But that's what you're looking for, is to, to work with someone who helps ignite the spark that you have and keep that forward momentum going. And it's really incredible when you get, when you find people that you're compatible with uh, in that way, you know? And uh, it's hard to say, it just comes out of nowhere and you can start from any direction, really. How much material did you guys write? We just, a couple hundred songs in the last year. Yeah, and we recorded them all. And, you know, strings and I was, all I did was spend money all year. <laughs> the people at the musicians' union, like the president, he's always patting me on the back. <laughs> Anything you need, you let me know. So you're here in they a... Got, they got me on speed dial. <laughs> <laughs> you're here in a, um, an acoustic setting, a stripped-down setting, mm -hmm. um, you know, compared to what we hear on the album. Is this something that you can take on the road? Well, this is how the songs started. This is kind of how they big, all of these songs began, was in a room with maybe me, me or Pat, or me or someone else. So it's interesting. I mean, I, you know, the way these songs come together, uh, anything's possible. We can do it like this, or we can do it with the band. And, but I don't know. I mean, we don't have any plans, but I'm not opposed to the idea of doing some shows. So I've been in my position as music director at KCRW for long enough that I have um, seen you a number of times and different incarnations, um, the Arcs and Black Keys, and also your, your debut solo record, Keep It Hid. Well, one time we were doing sound check and you came in the headphones and you're like, I can feel the reverberations of your rocking <laughs> through the walls. We, we, always, we always like, that was on repeat on the tour. <laughs> it was really good. Well, you know, I, I'll never forget meeting you that first time because it also is the beginning of my tenure as music director. So I was yeah. really new to what I was you doing. Were brand new. Um, and you rolled, you, you roll no, in. He what? He was brand new. Yeah, and and you roll in with these dudes, uh, Hacienda. Uh huh. Right. You were this band, Hacienda, yeah. and you guys they all were my looked, backing band. They were from. They're from Bernie, Texas, um, Mexican-American kids, three, three brothers and a cousin. And they put jalapenos on everything. And they would just make fun of me because I couldn't eat jalapenos. I was like, I, I, don't, I don't have that ability. I'm from Ohio. We don't have these. But what was funny is, you know, you guys as a group were pretty intimidating because you looked like you just walked out of the wilderness. I mean, you all had giant beards. Remember, you had a big red beard. <laughs> and yeah, uh, I, remember. I remember at one point uh, I made a comment about how, uh, geez, I feel out of place. Uh, I don't have a, a big beard. You were like, yeah, we might come in there and beat you up. <laughs> and I, I was like, I'm actually intimidated right now. Really? It's like... <laughs> I don't think I've ever intimidated anybody. That's amazing. <laughs> well, I, my question really around this is, is how, how did you go from point A to point B? You know, thinking about that time, right? Yeah. Keep It Hid, uh, songs like uh, Heartbroken and Disrepa Disrepair. Sure. Um, uh, well, you know, I mean, that first record, there's songs like Going Home and um, Trouble Weighs a Ton, Trouble that I sing with ton. my uncle, yeah. you know? And those songs, my uncle who taught me how to sing and play and who sang bluegrass songs with me, um, what, I, what, I'm, what I did in the last year feels more like that 
to me than anything I've ever done. It feels more like the things that drew me to music when I first started back in the day, seeing my uncles and my aunt play with the Martin guitars and sing like Stanley Brothers songs. You know, that's what made me want to play. And subconsciously, that's why I wanted to go to Nashville. And I dreamed in my mind that if I built a studio, I w it would happen, you know? And it's like, I didn't know these guys. I just hoped that it would happen, and it's happening, you know? Do you think it's fair to say to go from keep it hid, you know, essentially defensive, mm -hmm. closed, to shine on me? <laughs> yeah. Do you think it's Nashville? I think it has a lot to do with Nashville, but it has a lot to do with the Nashville that I've created for myself. And these particular people who are very special. Yeah. Dan Auerbach for KCRW. Um, hey, thank you for taking the time for KCRW. So we, uh, we appreciate you, man. Dan Auerbach.